Respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, is the most common and identifiable cause of lower respiratory tract infections in children under the age of two years old. In fact, almost all children by the age of two years have been infected with the virus. RSV can lead to more severe respiratory infections. The most common include bronchiolitis and pneumonia. For example, in Canada, during the late fall and winter months, RSV accounts for up to 80% of bronchiolitis hospitalizations and about 25% of pneumonia hospitalizations. Although all infants are at risk of severe RSV complications, the risk increases among infants with certain medical conditions like prematurity. RSV is a potentially devastating infection that not only burdens families, but also results in significant healthcare system costs. While there is no specific treatment for RSV, there are pre-exposure immunization options currently available to help protect against infection. Health Canada has authorized two immunization products for infants that have been shown to prevent RSV infection and its complications. This educational program for healthcare professionals will provide an in-depth overview on RSV, how it spreads, the impact of the disease on infants, and how to protect infants against RSV. We will focus on the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations, NACI, Statement on the Prevention of Respiratory Syncytial Virus, RSV Disease in Infants, published in July 2024 to support this program. RSV is a single-stranded RNA virus derived from the paramyxovirus family. The virus has a specific attachment protein known as the F protein on its surface, which attaches to the respiratory epithelial cells. RSV is transmitted when infected droplets containing the virus enter a person's mouth, eyes, and or nose. RSV is spread either through close contact with infected individuals, through sharing personal items, such as drinks, and or through contaminated surfaces. The main issue with RSV infection is lower airway obstruction and the resultant complications. Bronchiolar narrowing leads to airflow limitations, such as coughing and wheezing. Consequently, pulmonary function can be significantly compromised, leading to symptoms of dyspnea and decreased oxygenation. In severe cases of RSV, hypoxemia can result in alveolitis or inflammation in the air sacs, leading to respiratory failure. In Canada, the highest incidence of RSV infection typically occurs between November and March. During its peak season, RSV is responsible for up to 80% of all lower respiratory tract infections in children. While there were few infections during the COVID-19 pandemic due to strict public health restrictions, the lessening of social distancing precautions during the 2022-2023 season led to an early increase in RSV infections, resulting in many children, especially children under 2 years of age, being hospitalized. While RSV can infect persons of all ages, the highest incidence of lower respiratory tract infection occurs among infants between the ages of 2 and 6 months, which is during their first season of RSV. RSV accounts for a high incidence rate of 10% to 20% of medically attended respiratory infections in infants, including healthy infants with no pre-existing medical conditions. While the risk of severe outcomes from RSV is greater in high-risk infants and children, the burden on the healthcare system is greatest in healthy-term infants due to the unanticipated increase of acute care needs. Although all infants are at risk for RSV complications, the risk of severe infection during their first RSV season is higher in infants with the following conditions. Prematurity, or infants born at less than 37 weeks. Abnormal upper airway anatomy. Chronic lung disease, including bronchopulmonary dysplasia, requiring ongoing assisted ventilation, oxygen therapy or chronic medical therapy in the six months prior to the start of the RSV season, cystic fibrosis with respiratory involvement and or growth delay, hemodynamically significant chronic cardiac disease, severe immunodeficiency, severe congenital airway anomalies impairing the clearing of respiratory secretions, Structurally abnormal lungs, such as congenital diaphragmatic hernias. Neuromuscular disease causing cough and impaired clearing of respiratory secretions and Down syndrome. 
Certain infants are still at ongoing risk of severe disease during their second RSV season. For instance, all infants considered high risk during their first RSV season are still considered high risk in their second season, with the exception of those born prematurely under 37 weeks. Beyond age and comorbidities, other associated risk factors for RSV illness include being born between April and September, crowded living conditions, daycare attendance, the presence of school-age siblings in the home, multiple births, such as twins, and passive exposure to cigarette smoke. In Canada, RSV infection leads to more than 5,700 hospitalizations in infants annually. The case fatality rate for in-hospital RSV deaths in children 0 to 12 months of age is 0.1%, although this rate is higher in children with underlying conditions. 70% of hospitalizations in children less than 2 years of age are attributed to RSV infection. Bronchiolitis, or infection of the lower respiratory tract, is a disorder most commonly caused by RSV in infants. The cost of hospitalization for bronchiolitis in children less than one year of age is significant, placing an even greater strain on an already overstretched healthcare system and on the families of the infected children. In addition to the impacts of acute RSV illness, children who are hospitalized with bronchiolitis in their infancy are more likely to experience respiratory problems, like recurrent wheezing when they get older, compared to those who did not have severe disease. However, it is unclear whether severe viral infection of the respiratory tract early in life predisposes children to develop recurrent wheezing, or if infants who experience severe bronchiolitis have an underlying predisposition to recurrent wheezing. As there is no specific management of RSV infection, supportive care such as oxygen, O2 saturation monitoring, and hydration are the mainstays. In the absence of specific treatment, there are two mainstays of RSV prevention in infants, hygiene and infection control and prevention, and pre-exposure immunization. Primary prevention by simple hygiene measures is extremely important. Parents and caregivers of children can help to minimize the chances of their infant's exposure to RSV through the following infection control and prevention strategies. Hand washing, avoiding crowds, avoiding persons with upper respiratory tract infections, avoiding secondhand smoke, and avoiding daycare if possible. Given the significant burden of RSV-related disease in children under the age of two years and the absence of specific management options of acute RSV infection, there is agreement that high-risk babies, as well as infants without underlying conditions, would benefit from specific preventative measures of immunization. The latest NACI statement on protecting infants from RSV highlights two immunization products approved by Health Canada, Nersevimab a monoclonal antibody administered directly to infants, and RSV pre-F, a vaccine containing the prefusion stabilized F protein from the RSV virus, which is administered to a pregnant person to protect the infant through the passive transfer of maternal antibodies. Importantly, in Canada, several provinces and territories are funding RSV prophylaxis programs. For example, Ontario and Quebec will provide universal RSV prevention programs for all babies. Healthcare providers can contact their local health authority for details on availability in their respective regions. Nersevimab is a monoclonal antibody authorized with an indication to directly protect all infants in their first RSV season and infants who remain vulnerable to severe RSV disease in their second RSV season. Nersevimab has been shown to reduce RSV-related hospital admissions and medically attended RSV infections by around 80% in healthy infants. Nersevimab has also been shown to be effective in reducing the rate of medically attended RSV infections and severe disease in high-risk infants due to prematurity, congenital heart disease, and chronic lung disease. The protection provided by monoclonal antibodies takes effect immediately. If administered at birth, Nirsevimab confers high protection in the first months of life, when infants are most at risk of RSV infection, and may provide full season protection. Based on pharmacokinetic data, Nirsevimab is expected to be effective for up to eight months following administration, but data are not yet available. The most common side effects after immunization with Nirsevimab in infants are rash, pain, swelling, or hardness where the injection was given. 
Nirsevimab is supplied in 50 mg purple plunger rod and 100 mg single-dose light blue plunger rod pre-filled syringes. For neonates and infants entering their first RSV season and weighing less than 5 kg, a 0.5 mL dose 50 mg per 0.5 mL should be administered intramuscularly in the anterolateral thigh for babies not yet walking. For neonates and infants entering their first RSV season and weighing 5 kg or more, a 1 mL dose 100 mg per 1 mL should be administered intramuscularly. For infants who remain vulnerable to severe RSV disease entering their second RSV season, the product monograph advises that a single dose of 200 mg, 2 times 100 mg per 1 mL, should be administered intramuscularly, using two separate injection sites. Nirsevimab should be refrigerated at 2 degrees Celsius to 8 degrees Celsius and should not be frozen, shaken, or exposed to heat. After removal from the refrigerator, Nirsevimab may be kept at room temperature. 20 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius for a maximum of 8 hours or should be discarded after 8 hours. Nirsevimab can be administered on the same day or at any time before or after routine childhood vaccines, including the influenza vaccine. RSV PREF is a vaccine administered to people who are between 32 and 36 weeks pregnant. The vaccine protects infants in their first RSV season through the passive transfer of maternal antibodies to the fetus by the active immunization of a pregnant person. The RSV pre-F vaccine administered to pregnant people has been shown to reduce RSV-associated hospital admissions in their infants by 57%. The vaccine also reduces medically attended RSV respiratory tract infection in infants by 51% in their first RSV season. The protective efficacy of RSV pre-F takes some time to develop. Therefore, it needs to be administered at least two weeks before birth to allow for the transplacental transfer of protective antibodies. Efficacy of RSV pre-F vaccine is high in the first months of life when infants are most at risk for RSV during the RSV season. Due to waning of the passively transferred antibodies in neonates over time, the protective effect may not exceed six months of age in infants. The most common side effects for pregnant people after receiving the RSV pre-F vaccine are usually mild to moderate. Common side effects include pain at the injection site, headache, muscle pain, and nausea. RSV pre-F is supplied as a single-dose vial of lyophilized powder that needs to be reconstituted with sterile water, a diluent, and a pre-filled syringe. A 0.5 milliliter dose of RSV pre-F should be administered intramuscularly. The standard vaccine schedule of RSV pre-F for pregnant people is one dose given between 32 and 36 weeks of gestation. RSV pre-F is a recombinant protein subunit vaccine and is not live. Although there are limited data, co-administration of RSV pre-F vaccine with the tetanus, diphtheria, and acellular pertussis Tdap vaccine in healthy pregnant people aged 18 to 49 years has been shown to be safe. Additionally, influenza and RSV vaccines can be administered concurrently, although there are limited data. RSV pre-F vaccine should be refrigerated at 2 degrees Celsius to 8 degrees Celsius, protected from light, and not frozen. Discard if the vaccine has been frozen. After reconstitution, RSV pre-F should be stored between 15 degrees Celsius and 30 degrees Celsius and administered within 4 hours. Given the significant burden of disease in all infants from RSV and its impacts on the healthcare system, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, NACI, has recommended a universal RSV program for protecting all infants against RSV using Nirsevimab, which includes any infant less than 8 months of age entering or born during their first RSV season and infants entering or in their second RSV season who are at increased risk for severe RSV disease, usually between 8 and 19 months of age. According to NACI, nirsevimab is preferred over RSV pre-F. The RSV pre-F vaccine may be considered at an individual level depending on the situation, but is currently not recommended for an immunization program. If it is anticipated that nirsevimab will be administered to a healthy infant during the first few months of birth, then RSV pre-F in pregnancy may not provide added benefit for the healthy infant. These options and preferential recommendations need to be clearly explained to parents or expecting parents.
the ideal timing and setting for the administration of Nerseva map would be immediately at birth. However, depending on local constraints, contexts, and challenges, this may not be possible. For infants unable to receive Nerseva map at birth and infants entering their second RSV season, local public health authorities and healthcare providers should make efforts to ensure parents and guardians are given opportunities in the community to get their eligible infants vaccinated against RSV. The advent of effective RSV preventative options for children under the age of two years is a significant and promising advancement for addressing severe RSV disease and its complications. As seen in other countries, a successful publicly funded program with Nirsevimab for all infants will reduce the burden on our healthcare system and, of course, on affected families. However, healthcare providers should be aware of potential challenges to accessing these publicly funded universal programs. These challenges may affect marginalized populations, unattached patients, families living in rural and remote areas, and indigenous populations, such as First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Disparities in health outcomes among disadvantaged populations have been well documented in the context of respiratory illnesses, including RSV. These disparities are evident in the disproportionately higher rates of hospitalization and the reduced access to both treatment and preventative measures. For these publicly funded programs to be optimally successful, it is important that healthcare providers understand and consider regional, local, and or specific potential barriers to access. Understanding these barriers will inform and enable the implementation of context-specific approaches that ensure equitable and optimal distribution of these highly effective RSV preventative immunization programs. RSV accounts for a significant burden of disease in children under the age of two years, as well as their caregivers and families. RSV disease can cause serious complications in infants, including hospitalization and intensive care unit ICU, admission, and may potentially lead to longer-term respiratory impacts. The availability of preventative immunization strategies represents a critical advancement in reducing adverse outcomes and protecting this highly vulnerable population. By integrating these preventative measures into clinical practice, healthcare professionals can significantly reduce the considerable strain that RSV places on both families and the healthcare system. A concerted effort to adopt and promote these protective measures will ultimately support the preservation of the healthcare system's capacity and foster a more resilient response to RSV at the population level.